Good morning, Your Honor. Deborah Schlossman, Mr. Adrian Lottie. Dr. Adrian Lottie, who is approaching. Right. Your Honor, to take the date and time set for sentencing. Um, Mr. Dr. Lottie and I are in receipt of the pre sentence report. We have no additions, deletions, or corrections. Your Honor, um, Mr. Dr. Sorry, Dr. Lottie. Dr. Lottie. Um, has no criminal record until this case. He's about to be 77 years old. He cares for his mother, who's about to turn 104. Um, on the night in question, we know this is not an excuse, but his mother had been hospitalized and he got a call from the hospital that something was wrong and he immediately went to the hospital. When he had uh, drank alcohol that night, when he drank alcohol, he did not expect to be going anywhere. He knows that he should have called a friend or called Uber, but this was his mother who's very old and that he was taking care of and what just rushed there to attend to her and see what was going on. Um, he's sorry that he did that. Um, Your Honor, he has a very impressive uh, life. He's been very active in the civil rights movement. He's also a college professor. He teaches civil rights law, and he was very active in several organizations in the city of Detroit with regard to civil rights over decades. Um, Your Honor, he's got a CV that's over 20 pages long. He does a tremendous amount of community service um, and educating the community. He also is a real estate agent and an expert witness um, in trials and, and other legal matters. Um, Your Honor, because he cares for his mother, she often gets up at two or three in the morning in the middle of the night. And so testing on the Soberlink has been difficult for him because he had a stroke a few years ago and he's required to get a certain amount of hours of sleep because not enough sleep causes high blood pressure. And that's why he had his stroke. Um, Your Honor, so we are asking, even though it says to continue with the Soberlink for 30 days, he has been compliant with the Soberlink. He hasn't had a single incident, and it's been many months that he's been on it. We're asking that you consider either doing away with it or that you consider lessening the amount of testing. He says that the most difficult time to wake up to test is the one at six in the morning because he is up in the middle of the night caring for his mother, and then he go tries to go to sleep. Um, so if your honor would consider maybe cutting the amount of testing or giving him a later testing time, we would appreciate it. I think he's currently testing three times, so we would ask for two. Your Honor, also, we would ask possibly if there could be less than a nine-month probation term. I mean, he's almost 77, never had an incident until this. It's an aberration. It's not who he is. And as you know, the presumption is against probation for a case like this, for first-time OWIs. And we would ask that you also possibly consider no probation. Uh, Your Honor, he would like to say something to the court. Doctor, what would you like to tell the court? Uh, <clears throat> just that I'm very sorry and remorseful about all the trouble I caused to all the people involved in this. And when I took the uh, victim impact uh, course, uh, I had already had some sense of the trouble that drinking and driving causes but I hadn't really internalized it as much as I did after seeing the, the class that, that made me kind of realize it more. I have myself been victim of drunk driving, of, but I never got hurt. I just got car damage, sometimes pretty badly, but but it still didn't give me the same sense that that video gave me. When I took that course, that gave me a much stronger sense of just what it does to, to people physically and psychologically. So I'm very rem remorseful about that. <clears throat> The court does acknowledge this is not a serious misdemeanor as defined by statute. However, it does believe that there are reasonable grounds to depart from a non-probationary sentence. Particularly, the alcohol screening and assessment identifies the benefit of an early intervention program and the abstinence from all intoxicants. Probation, the court will then follow the recommendation of probation for probationary supervision with the stated rehabilitative goals to promote change, prevent recidivism, and to monitor compliance of recommended treatment. Therefore, the sentence of the court, I'll place you on probation for a period of nine months. 
You are to pay $855 fines and court costs, $100 prosecution recovery costs, $100 police agency recovery costs, and $270 probation oversight fee. When can you pay that? Your Honor, can you have a payment plan? Does he have anything today? Oh, yes. What, what, what can you pay today? Tell the judge. I don't know. Uh, how much is that all together? Give me a total. Thirteen twenty-five. Half. Okay. One half today. And then the balance is arranged by probation on a payment plan. Thank you, Your Honor. There should be no use of alcohol, recreational marijuana, or any illegal substance. You'll be subject to testing as requested by probation. You are to complete an alcohol awareness program and to do that within the next 60 days. You are to provide proof of the victim's impact panel attendance to probation. You completed that. With regard to the sober link, the sober link will continue uh, for a period of 30 days in lieu of the four days in jail. I'm not going to reduce the testing. It's the program that I have in place. I'm doing that in lieu of what would be my, what would be part of my sentence, which might be four days in jail. So I'm giving him that as an alternative to it. Thank you. I'll order 93 days in jail. Credit one, the balance is suspended. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. My understanding there's a motion. That's correct, Your Honor. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I had filed a motion to ask the court to consider allowing Mr. Pettiprin to withdraw his plea. The basis for the request is that his plea was not made knowing um, or voluntary in the sense that he did not have all of the information that he would need to have um, to make the plea relative to his discovery. He indicated to me after our first meeting that he had never seen his police report. I was able to get it from the um, from uh, Ms. Hightower, uh, as I had just been appointed on the case to review it with him. He didn't know that some of the information he contemplated being present was actually, in fact, addressed in the police report. And um, he would have considered um, taking his case to trial had he known that. He also had never seen the video footage um, from, from the dash cam or body cam that was available to him and has asked that uh, the court consider that in the interest of justice as well, allowing him to withdraw his plea so that he can uh, make a, an informed decision moving forward as to how to proceed. I had discussed this with the prosecution in hopes of maybe trying to resolve the case in an alternative way and we could stipulate to the withdrawal of the plea. There was some, some discussions as to potential other settlements, but at, at this time we've not reached an agreement on that and we're just waiting on the court to issue a decision. Okay, it, based upon what I have in front of me, um, there was a request either for an evidentiary hearing on that. I don't know if that is still the request. If he's saying he didn't see the information, yeah, this defendant had been before the court on numerous occasions. Um, adjourning everything out so that the defendant could indeed review the materials and other things regarding this case. I am having a hard time believing that he didn't have that information um, from counsel or otherwise have, have requested that information and or refused it. Um, yeah. No, uh, thank you though. To talk to you? To me? Yeah. Oh, uh, um, hold on. So uh, what he's explained to me is that he requested this many times and was um, given granted adjournments to uh, be allowed to review, but he had never reviewed it. So that's the position that he's maintained. If the court is inclined to schedule an evidentiary hearing on that issue, I understand that I'll explain that to Mr. Pettiprint. All right, because my inclination would be to deny his motion. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that this matter had been pending since May of 2023. He enters his plea on October 4th, but that's, of course, after he's been out on bench warrant status. And then he's going to indicate that, in essence, he knew nothing about the case or what was contained in the report prior to entry of his plea. I'm having a very difficult time believing that. So, 
I will, and I will need his previous counsel to indicate what has happened on that. So I'll set an evidentiary hearing. I'll set that hearing for April 10th, 2024 at 3 p.m. And your honor, will that be in person or by Zoom? In person. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll need to subpoena counsel, previous counsel here. Thank you, your honor. You're welcome. 